Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the Ultimate Guide to Redstone. In this video, we're going to be talking a little bit more about SR latches. More specifically, we're going to be talking about circuit analysis. What makes a good circuit using SR latches as our example circuit, so to speak. But before we get into that, I have to talk about something. And as you may guess from me blatantly staring at it for the entire video thus far, it has to do with the RS NAND latch that I built. Because I'm really still not quite sure what I was thinking when I built this thing, but this is by no means an RS NAND latch. I'm not sure what was going through my head, but yeah. And what I did wrong was you do not connect the outputs into both inputs. You connect the outputs into one input. So right here I have the output of this one, going into both inputs? No. You connect it to one input. So there. Now the output of this one, I have it going around into both inputs? Yeah, no. You have it going into just one input. And now all of a sudden, our RS NAND latch is going to make a little bit more sense. So, now, I, I can give you a little bit of a better idea of what makes the difference between an RS NAND latch and RS NOR latch. The big difference between RS NAND and RS NOR, RS NAND has inverted inputs. So this is the equivalent of this in an RS NOR latch. So 1-1 one, one is the equivalent of 0-0 zero, zero in RS NOR. Now if I want to set, I just turn off the one I want to set. So right now, I have it right here, so if I flip this, it sets. And if I flip it this way, it resets. And I know that wasn't the most in-depth explanation, but, you know, it's the same thing as RS NOR in terms of functionality, it's just the inputs are inverted. So yeah, and that's useful for certain cases, but we'll go over that when we get to it. But yeah, hopefully that's all corrected now, and I know I sort of rushed through that, so... You know, I don't want to feel like I rushed through it, so I'm just going to build you another one, just to make it absolutely clear how to build one. So, I'm going to take NAND gate, like this, NAND gate, I'm going to take another NAND gate. And again, not the best design, this is just so you see how to build it and how the logic goes. Output of one goes into an input of the other. In fact, I'm just going to do it like this, because I'm lazy. And output of one goes into input of the other, which I'm again going to do like this, because I'm lazy. And not both, just one. And now if I take both outputs of the NAND gates, these are the outputs of my RS NAND latch. So there. Now if I flip this, Goes, latch goes that way, flip this, latch goes that way. This is RS NAND. Hopefully that's all cleared up. I'm, again, sorry, not sure what was going on, but yeah. And now we can actually start getting to the main point of the video, which is circuit analysis. What makes a good circuit? Okay, so I have this basic RS NOR latch, and we're going to be using this to start talking about circuit analysis. What makes the best circuit? Well, this really depends on a case-by-case -case basis. You might want some ridiculous circuit, and that might be perfect for you, and it might be horrible in every other situation except that one. So it's hard to say definitively this is the best circuit for any specific purpose, because you will always be able to find some case where there's another design that's better. But, in general, there's two things that make a circuit good its size, and its speed. Now, I could talk about both of those at once, but I think it'd be better if I just separated them out and talked about them independently. And I'm going to start with speed. What makes the fastest redstone circuit? And to clarify, I should say, what makes the fastest redstone circuit without using instant wire? Because since instant wire is, well, instant, you can make any redstone circuit completely instantaneous if you really tried hard enough. So that kind of defeats the point of making something, or trying to engineer something for speed, if you already know it's going to be instant. But, assuming we don't have instant wire, what would be the fastest non-instant wire circuit? So with absolutely nothing in it that's instant, what's the fastest circuit? As it turns out, there's a pretty simple theorem that can give you the fastest speed of any redstone circuit. 
the fastest possible speed that doesn't involve instant wire. And this theorem deals with circuit transparency. Now, if you're an electronics person, you might have heard this term before. And in redstone, its meaning is a little bit different than it is in electronics, so don't assume you already know this. It is similar, I'll be the first to admit that. Not quite the same. A redstone circuit is considered to be transparent on any given input if the input has a direct path through the circuit. So in the case of this specific RS NOR, it's transparent on both inputs because the wire that goes to the input is the same wire that's going to the output. The current has a direct path to the output. Same on both of these wires. And yeah, so this is transparent on both input A and input B, on both the set and the reset. And the reason circuit transparency is important is because if you have just a single straight wire going through, then that means the power goes through the circuit instantaneously. So if I just have this huge chain of circuits which are all completely transparent on all inputs, I could literally chain as many of those together as I want and it would compute completely instantaneously with no instant wire used, except for all the repeater delays. And that's why tra circuit transparency is incredibly important. So, that's what circuit transparency is, and it's the first part of making a circuit as fast as possible. Now, like I said, in this case, it it's transparent on both of them. So, therefore, it, it is this circuit is already as fast as it can possibly be because it's instantaneous. You can't get much faster than being instantaneous. But yeah. But we're going to assume, for sake of example, that this circuit isn't instantaneous. And that we need to figure out how to make it as fast as it can possibly be. Which, of course, is instantaneous. So, let's talk about that. So, first off... Let's talk about when an input can and can't be transparent. Because unfortunately, it's not always possible to make an input transparent. The one and only case where you can't have a transparent input is if the output will be the opposite of whatever you're putting in. One key example is the NOT gate, where the output's always the opposite of what you're putting in. It, because right now I'm putting in 0, the output's 1 it's impossible to make this transparent because there's no way to have a single straight wire that results in the opposite of its power because yeah there's absolutely no way I can send power through this and suddenly make the output not have power unless I have a torch so yeah I can't possibly have a straight path through and have the opposite going through I have to have at least a one tick delay anytime the output's the opposite of the input okay and that's really the only case where an input can't be transparent. So conversely, the only case where an input can be transparent is when the output will be the exact same as the input. So I'm going to take an AND gate, for example. Now, you might think, okay, well clearly an AND gate can't be transparent because if I flip any input by itself, that doesn't result in an output. True, but if I flip the one input in this state, then all of a sudden, this input has become transparent. Because I have, or it hasn't become transparent, it's now possible to make this input transparent. Because if I flip this lever, the output is the same as the input. There's a case where the output is the same as the input. So therefore, it's possible to make an AND gate which is transparent on either input A or input B, but not both. The reason it can't be both is because, right now, look, the output is the opposite of the input. So therefore, it's possible to make a transparent AND gate, but not on both inputs. So let's go ahead and do that. So first off, I'll do it on input A. So first off, we know for a fact that it's possible to get input A to be transparent. Since that means the current has to have a direct path through, I'll just send the input through like that. So now, I have a transparent, and right now it's assuming that's like that. But, that doesn't really quite make an AND gate. What we have to do is we have to do what we did for our very first AND gate design, which was like this. Put a piston. This way, when this is off, it blocks the current, and therefore only if A and B 
then it gives output. That's the only case. And this means it's transparent on input A, for the same reasons we've discussed, but not on input B. On input B, there's a one tick delay. So therefore, th that's the way you can easily figure out the fastest possible speed for any one gate. If you have the outputs always the same as the inputs, if there's always a case where the output's the same as the input, in every possible case, then therefore, the gate can be made instant. Or, excuse me, the circuit can be made instant. But if there's any case where the output will be the opposite of what you're putting in, there has to be a one tick delay. So therefore, the slowest speed a logic gate can be is one tick. Excuse me, the fastest speed any logic gate can be is one tick. It ca some gates might be faster, but all gates can be made at least one tick or faster. And the reason for that is, in the form of logic gates, there's no time when any input... Actually, have, and I want to think about this and make sure I say this right. Okay. All logic gates can be made one tick because there is no case in any logic gate where the output w won't be either the same as whatever you're putting in or the opposite of whatever you're putting in. There's no case at all when that's not true. So therefore, it can either be instant or can even require a single inversion. Therefore, all logic gates can be at least bumped up to one tick. Some logic gates might be possible to make them instant, but all logic gates can at least be bumped up to one tick. So therefore, we now have a very important piece in discovering the fastest speed any circuit can be. And that important piece is, since we know all logic gates can be made one tick or faster, a very good way to estimate, not necessarily get correct, but get a pretty good estimate of how the fastest speed a circuit can be, is take however many logic gates it needs to pass through to get to the end of the circuit, and then that's the a good estimate of the number of ticks it can potentially be the fastest at. And in some cases, that number, that estimate, might be good enough for you. You might be okay with that. But if you really want to save every last tick and get the fastest possible speed, then you'll need to do a little bit more. Because if you take a look, that clearly isn't always the fastest possible speed. Because right now, in order to get to the circuit, both this RS NOR latch requires NOT gates. NOT gates take one tick. Yet this RS NOR latch is instant. So how can it be instant if it's using NOT gates? This is where the transparency thing I was talking about comes into play, aside from just proving that all logic gates can be made one tick. Transparency is an important part in figuring out the true fastest possible speed of a redstone circuit. And really, an SR latch is too simple of a circuit to really demonstrate this concept on. But I can do the same thing I do with the logic gates and prove the fastest possible speed of an SR latch. So I'm going to break the inverse of the output and just get regular output. We have set, we have reset. So now set, the output is the same as the input. Therefore, set can be instant. Reset, the output is the opposite of the input, because we want to send it in a 1 and get out a 0. So therefore, we need one tick of delay there. So this isn't truly instant. Not sure why I said that, I guess I'm tired, but... Okay, yeah, this isn't truly instant, it's one tick. It's instant on some inputs, though. But it, So it's transparent, but it's not instant. There's a big difference there. Yeah, not sure. I guess I'm tired, but okay. Forgive me. And yeah, so the fastest speed of an SR latch is one tick. So, still pretty good. One tick with a transparent input is pretty good in speed terms. But yeah, so there, now we know the fastest possible speed of an SR latch. And again, I'll get into the true fastest speed a little bit down the road. For now, I'm just going to leave it here, because I think that estimate is really good enough for the vast majority of circuits. And I can't give a good demonstration of the true fastest speed calculation, without getting into a more complicated circuit than this. So I'm just going to wait till we get to the more complicated circuits to explain 
the more accurate fastest speed calculation. But yeah, so now we've talked about what makes the fastest circuit. Now let's talk about what makes the smallest circuit. Or not necessarily the smallest circuit, but what's the best size to go for. So, first thing I'm going to talk about in circuit sizes is just a way of determining how big a circuit is. So, from starting at the inputs, like this, facing your circuit, here's how we're going to determine the size. We're going to have three numbers. First off, the width. This is how wide the circuit is. How big it is in this direction. How many blocks. Easy enough. We have the height, which is how big it is up and down. And we have the depth, which is how big it is this way. The length of the circuit, so to speak. These are the three ways of measuring the size of a circuit. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to introduce a bit of terminology. Like we had transparency for speed, for size we have something called tileability. If a circuit is tileable in a circuit direction, I'll take width for sake of example, that means I could build a circuit directly next to it in that direction, and the both circuits would be able to work absolutely fine. So for this circuit is not tileable in width because, well, if I built, started building a circuit right next to it, yeah, doesn't work out. If it was tileable in height, that would mean I could build a circuit directly on top of it and it would still work. Doesn't quite work here. So, not tileable in height. And if I said it was tileable in depth, that would mean I could take, go from right here and start building a circuit. Which is kinda true. But it's debatable. It depends on how you want to define it. If you want to define it like that, well, okay, I guess it is tileable in depth. Okay. So it's tileable in depth, not really tileable anywhere else. So yeah. So now we have the idea of tileability in our mind. And if someone just says tileable without specifying which way, generally they're talking about width. And there's a reason for that. That's because all these dimensions are not weighted equally. Width is generally considered the most important dimension to be as small as possible in. Generally, too wide tileable is considered the best. That's generally what you want to go for, either one wide or two wide tileable. In terms of width, that's usually what you're going for, because when you pack circuits together, usually you're building them right next to one another. So being tileable in width means you're able to fit as many circuits next to each other, or in effect, as many circuits in as small of a space as possible. So that's why width is generally extremely valuable. Depth is the next most valuable, and that's because the longer a circuit is, the more repeaters you're going to need. If I built a circuit that's 15 long, then I can only have it going but so much further before I need another repeater. If I have a circuit that's only too deep, then I can pack potentially eight of those in series without needing a repeater. So, yeah, that's why depth is considered the second most important, and generally considered least important is the height. It's not going to matter that much how tall your circuit is, since you can travel upwards pretty much instantaneously, so height, generally the least important. But big one, definitely width. Depth and height, not as deeply considered, but depth is generally valued a little bit more than height. Now let's take apply all that to this circuit. This circuit is pretty wide, not tileable, so not good in the width, the most important area. In terms of depth, it's five deep, not the best, considering what it does. And in terms of height, well, it's incredibly small. So in terms of size, this circuit is an absolute nightmare, because it violates the rules in every way possible. It's really good in height and really bad in width. So how do we make an RS Snorlatch that's good for size? First off, we want to go for too wide. So I'm going to put my reset here. I'm just going to have that going into a torch. I'm going to have my set on top of it. This way, I could theoretically have two wide tileable circuit. Because this is set right here, and this is reset. Now, I'm just going to place a torch here, and this is an RS Norlatch design that's generally, it's a very good design for size. It still has the same speed, it's still transparent, so it's still one tick, still transparent on the set, and it's two wide tileable. So generally, this is a really good RS Norlatch design in terms of size. 
It's also only too deep, so even better. This is an in this is an incredibly good RS and Orlesh design. It's also why this design right here is also a really good design, even though it doesn't really look like it. It's one wide, not tileable, but that's okay because it's only one wide, and it's pretty fast and set and reset. So that's a very good RS and Orlesh design as well. But if you have to pick an RS and Orlesh design, this right here pretty much the best. Has fast as possible speed, and it's too wide tileable, not very deep, and very small. Pretty much best RS Norlash design possible. So, yeah. If you have to choose a design, choose this one. Very good design, based on speed and size criteria. And yeah, so that's how you determine, the, that's how you analyze strokes in terms of size and speed. What makes the best size, what makes the best speed. And yeah, hopefully that helps you design your circuits a little bit more, hopefully it helps you understand what makes a good circuit a little bit better. And yeah, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and in the next video we're going to start talking a little bit more about latches, and hopefully finishing up on latches. Probably going to have to do one more video after this about latches, but we're going to talk a bit about the flaws with using an SR latches. We're going to go back to the functionality of the circuit. So yeah, hope you enjoyed, see you next